you're building out your MVP. If both founders are not seeing it the same way, you know, if your first VP of sales or VP of product don't see it the same way, if CS are driving the, this and people are driving there, um, that's just going to cost you a lot of time and efforts to, to fix. Today, successful revenue leaders once started their careers just like you and I. They faced the challenges that their careers brought to them, they rose to the occasion, and became the leaders that we admire today. Join me as we explore the skills and stories that make a great leader with a pinch of vulnerability. Hello and welcome to Sales Therapy. I'm your host, Alper Yurder. Grab a chair. This is your exclusive invitation to the therapy room as leaders are going to be sharing their career defining moments, their secret tips and tricks in their arsenal towards success. And I promise we'll always end on a positive note. So today in the therapy chair, I have Joav Vilner, CEO and founder of Walnut, who is one of the pioneers of buyer centric selling and of our hashtag buyer enablement too, I would guess. Joav is a multi-time founder, angel advisor to startups, recently recognized by Forbes magazine as tech marketer to watch in 2024. We also had the pleasure of featuring in our sales almanac 2023 with 100 top LinkedIn revenue voices. Walnut has been recognized as a top startup to work for by many lists, including UK's favorite OTA, uh, top NYC startups by Startup Stash, among others. Today with Joav, We'll talk about his success, the joy, the pain, and the journey as usual. So welcome to therapy, um, Yoav. How are you feeling today? Always happy to do some uh, therapy discussions. Thanks for the invitation. Of course, my pleasure. Any good therapy starts with childhood and growing up years. I know you were born and raised in Tel Aviv, if I'm not wrong. Can you tell us a little bit about your younger years? Because it shapes the business person that we are, our values. Definitely in Israel, as you said. Actually, I grew up somewhere in the far north of Israel uh, mm. before I lived in Tel Aviv, which was a very distant you know, place in the suburbs, very quiet, a little river inside, lots of uh, grass, lots of green, lots of uh, oh, fresh air. But then, of course, I moved to Tel Aviv as everyone and started my, my career. During your school years, you moved to Tel Aviv or after that to start your career? So a little bit after, I was ah. also finishing my army service and then I went to... I went to Central America for one year. I traveled and oh, nice. yeah, and then I came back. I was about 22, 21 and I kickstarted my career. Where in America did you travel, if I may? Of course, uh, it was a good time. You know, I was just on the line of like crossing Honduras and Belize and Guatemala, places like that, some Caribbean islands and then Mexico and then back home with eyes full, full of tears. <laughs> but then you got used to it. I mean, obviously, Tel Aviv has an amazing climate, so I, I'm not going to feel too sorry for you as a Londoner. But I can imagine yeah. it must be heartbreaking after South America. Yeah, yeah. It took some time to settle. And then after that, did you always have in mind like a startup or tech world or growing up? What, what did you think you would become? So I had a different path in mind. I was not a tech person and, and not a marketing person and not a anything. But when I came back home from that one year that I was traveling, um, I just found interesting job opening that was around like online marketing, which was mm. brand new at the time. Mm. I don't even want to recall how many years ago that was, but it was still a, a new thing. There wasn't a lot of jobs in that front. And there was also not a lot of startups in, in Tel Aviv that raised funding or, or at all. And I started learning a little bit marketing uh, through that company and I was 22 at the time and then I realized there's like a gap where startups started to, to emerge in Tel Aviv they did like 300k 400k seed round which was like the biggest ever and for that year um, but they didn't have anywhere to spend you know marketing budgets there was no chief marketing officers like they didn't know how to go to market and there was no solution for that so uh, basically, I built like the first company that in retrospect, it was also for the first time globally mm -hmm. that focused, that did like marketing that was focused on startups. Okay. You have the way you talk about those times is as if it is from a different age. Don't let pe people guessing. When was this? Uh, relatively a while ago. It was about 12 years or 13 years ago. Yeah. Okay. I think we started about the, sa the same time. So you went straight into building your own thing, like, uh, you know, very early on, decided to be a founder or builder, right? Right. Yeah. Why did you want to, you know, go and do your own thing so early, so young? Or I ask this because uh, I'm a risk avert person and 
it took me 10 or more years of career before I start being a first time founder. So it's interesting for me. Right. So for me, it was the complete opposite, but it mm. kind of uh, developed in a way I didn't expect. Like at first it was just, it wasn't even a company. It was me and a friend. We were reaching out via LinkedIn to some startup founders that we saw raised like an initial seed round, mm -hmm. but the response rate was like a hundred percent. So it, there was no spam on LinkedIn. Everything was legit. You know, people were excited to get a LinkedIn message. So anyway, we ended up working with like 600 clients. We had offices in London, we had offices in Manhattan and everything just really happened, uh, you know, really fast. So you're an advisor, a, a, an angel investor. In all these years, how many founders have you interacted with? And then how many of them you've become an advisor, an investor? Do you have like ballpark figures in your head you can share? I would guess over 1,000. Do you have a favorite? Um, no, you know, every, I learned a little bit of, of something from everyone. You know, some of them were customers of that agency. Some of them were people I built companies with afterwards. Some of them were people that I co-invested in other companies. Like there was, you know, millions of interactions. But I, from the first days when I had no background, no connections, no nothing, I tend to kind of learn from other people. Love it. On those days when you didn't have the connections, didn't have any of those things, how did that feel? Did you have the power in you to go and build something from scratch? What is that secret thing that got you to today, you think? It was just building nonstop. You know, it's like a drive. You don't really control it. You're like, mm. you just have to do something. You want to work for yourself and you want to build something that can touch like millions of people. After the agency, I was actually one of the founding members of a startup using AI to save kids from bullies on social media. And we raised a double digit seed round. It was like 2017. So uh, that was uncommon. And AI was still not what it is now. So you literally had to build your own models and it mm -hmm. was really expensive. And we tried to save kids from bullies and pedophiles and bad people on you know social networks. And that was kind of me wanting to build again, but also do something that's really good for you know, for the environment from various reasons, you know, the market was not there. Technology was not there. There was no Gen AI, stuff like that. But that was another thing that I did just before Walnut. On the flip side, any worries, anxieties you had to particularly overcome, you had to build, you had to learn any of those that you want to share? You always have them if you're building companies. Needless to say, you know, it's been like 18 months of a very special time you know, for, for tech as a whole and what happened with like funding and multiples and then what's been going on in Tel Aviv um, the past months. So um, there's always stuff to worry about besides the usual, you know, startup is a roller coaster type of uh, cash phases. So um, there's always what to worry about. And, you know, we always try and worry about the next step. Like what's the next step we need to reach? Um, people often ask me about, you know, like you said, all the noise we're making and the brand stuff and, uh, mm. you know, the world and this and that. But we try to focus on the customers we have and we try to focus on the product and always look at what's the next step that we're trying to get to. Did you ever feel building all those different businesses, etc., even with Walnut, did you ever feel like you know what the customer wants and you have the good pulse of them? But at some point you are losing it, you are losing the, or you need to be better at listening to them. So sometimes when I'm building Flola, I'm like, yeah, I had 400 interviews. I know what they want. Um, the content, this has to be the content because this is what's top of mind for them. The product, this has to be da da da. And then you feel like, Ugh, am I losing touch? Did you ever feel that in building any of these products? So one thing that I learned from that AI company was that you shouldn't build things the market doesn't want as much as they sound amazing and Walnut was like the opposite. It was like, it was like, you know, the initial interviews we had with, with CROs, VP sales, they turned into a huge wait list, which later evolved into one of the biggest launches of product hunt in 2020, which later evolved into a whole category, you know, with like a lot of companies now. So I, we started from what the clients needed mm -hmm. and what the clients wanted. Otherwise, you know, like I learned my lesson and I wouldn't have built a company in the first place, it was just like a huge need and a huge gap in the market. And nobody wanted their salespeople to be engaged with like talking to R&D people, product people, design people to build out demos and then have them break anyway. So it was always from what exactly what the clients wanted from day mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So my next question was actually what led you to build Walnut and you started obviously talking about it. In a nutshell, other than the customer need, etc., what other things led you to build Walnut? Um, it was a, so yeah, it was a huge pain. It was a burning need, and the timing was right. We actually, you know, we were we were building the company initially mid twenty twenty. So there was a lockdown going on. I couldn't uh, even meet my co-founder as as we were ideating and building out the MVP, and he lived just a couple of blocks from me, but we still couldn't meet up. At one time, the only thing that was allowed if you walked a dog in the street. And so mm -hmm. I took a dog from one of my neighbors and I went over to his place. But, but you know, it was like a crazy roller coaster of, you know, a good market and a bad market and a good market and a crisis. But anyway, so it was, it was also timing in terms of, because COVID was also the time where sales became remote mm -hmm. all of a sudden and, and people do, didn't fly to meet prospects. So there was also an amazing timing for, for such a, you know, such a platform. The, team, the founding team, of course, was really strong and the initial investors were good. So it's like, it was, it was a little bit of, of, of everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. It's the same with my journey. Like when stars align and you have a few things come together, it becomes inevitable. My co-founder is like you. He, he only very briefly worked in the PNG and this is his fourth startup. And actually, I, I asked him, okay, like go get your funding and I'm going to be your first sales guy and you'll pay me my salary. You'll give me a bit of shares and, and we'll do it. I'll do it for you. And he said, no, 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 come be our third. Um, and other than many other things, that, that, that was one of the stars aligning for me to start. I'm particularly Amazing. interested in, I mean, as somebody obviously who raised their first round, um, when I look at, you know, guys like you, Series B, C, et cetera, that journey from Series A to B is always fascinating to me because I think that's the moment, that's a break or make moment for me, it feels like, from my experience. Did it feel the same for you? Like going from A to B, did you feel like, okay, there is something here we should push? Um, I think in between round, like also between C and A, it's a mm. pretty spooky point of time, right? So it's a very complicated um, path to go through every time you're ahead of your, your next funding. And yeah, Series B and C and those, you know, they're, they're like a growth round where the qualifications are all different. It's no longer about your dream, your vision, your you know, your mission and all that. It's not just traction. It's, you know, how the cohorts are looking and the retention and churn and expansion. And yeah. there's like a million things, especially now in the current reality in, in the market uh, that is pretty, pretty unique. Um, so I would say today the bar for raising a, got, it increased massively. You should have like 1 million in revenues, a lot of clients that are praising and singing praise for your product. Yeah. So it's definitely, it's definitely not easy now. I think... Uh, I think you guys, you know, like like us, we're part of a broad landscape where people need help. They need help with making processes better yeah. and, and buying and selling processes is kind of the heart of it. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of potential. I think you guys can make it. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Yes, we have a lot of competition. And obviously, Israel, Tel Aviv, it, with sales tech, it's always very ahead. So we do our best. Um, again, moving from A to B, I'm very curious, um, some observations regarding revenue, sales, etc. Were you observing that your deals, deal sizes were getting larger, maybe sales cycles becoming a bit longer as you move upwards in the, in the business or in the market? Um, did you observe those? And if you observed those, like, how did you start tackling them? How did you start reacting to those changes about go to market? Yeah, so as you mature, like you said, you have, you start to have bigger clients and, you know, suddenly we were work working with like, you know, Dell and, 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 and Adobe and, and wow. Equifax and, and companies that are, they're not your uh, friends. They're people that need to get value the people that need to get something back for, for their money. And, you know, the demos have to work all the time and the outcome has to be valuable. And this is what we were basically, you know, aiming for since day one like to be the trusted uh, advisor for those type of companies. Always, you know, initially there's always problems with like some in infrastructure, some stability, right? You onboard the first clients and they have their expectations and you're still a very, very young team. Yeah. But we yeah. scaled really fast in terms of, you know, in terms of onboarding clients, in terms of onboarding employees and, and raising funding. So we had a lot of dynamic changes we had to make 
to maintain that scale and, and you know, and live through it across all, all of the company. Mm. As a very buyer-centric organization, like how did you see the role of sales versus client success? Or did you see them together from the get-go? How did you figure out how to shape your go-to-market organization, where, where the strengths should be? I think existing clients are, you know, they're always just a bit more important than getting new ones. Also, it's more expensive to acquire new ones than yeah. expand new cl uh, existing clients. But also, if you don't prove uh, expansion potential, then you're going to have problems later on uh, because companies that haven't expanded are a bit le more likely to churn and your future Series A investor is going to want to to yeah. see that there's expansion. expansion yeah. So uh, we always try to put our CS like, you know, in in the heart of the company alongside other, other uh, departments. Today, we have a chief revenue officer that, you know, she's one of the top industry experts. But before that, we killed more in a, you know, zero to one type of way. But, you know, we had an amazing founding team that was in charge of, of all that. And I was very uh, privileged to work with all those people. I want to give a bit of insight for the listeners and then I'll go into the questions. But you're building and scaling the business now, Series B. Your latest investment was over $35 billion, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if, if mm -hmm. I am, please. So I'm wondering, and actually bringing the CRO is one of the questions in this section. Uh, what's your focus right now? Like what do you try to focus on? And has, how has it shifted from that A series A to B, if it has? There's a, f a few stuff going on. You know, one of them is the situation in, in Israel where it's not our biggest hub for, for you know, in terms of headcount. We have more people globally, but it's, of course, a very unfortunate situation. Some people are in the army service and they haven't been with us for a few months, which also is going to have all kinds of implications on, on Israel as a country and as a tech nation and you know, stuff like that, that we will only know about later, later in the year. I would say macro stuff that make companies buy less yeah. SaaS products. And, you yeah, know, of course. we started, we started the real prospects movement because we wanted to put prospects um, in the center of everything. Now there's just less buying and, you know, people are definitely want to cut more uh, products and pay less for products. So um, I think the entire tech industry is kind of, learning how to, you know, how to explore those type of uh, problems. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think, you know, we, we scaled in a way that I'm very proud of. Like we were very on top of like building the right, you know, leadership team and, and management. And as a CEO, I was always trying to complement my skills and especially the missing skills with people much smarter and more experienced than me in every type of aspect. Yeah, that's a good privilege to have once you have a bit of money. You can bring people who are much, much better than you, hopefully, <laughs> in terms of solving those challenges. At what point did you hire your first CRO and why did you hire your first CRO? She's been with us for a few months now. And, you know, we, we felt that there is a steady go to market motion. Like we've proven the initial traction. We've proven enterprise companies working with us. We've proven clients, you know, saying that they saw actual value from the product. Um, there's a lot of inbound demand for what we do, and there's a lot of, you know, success in performing um, uh, outbound. When you feel your, obviously, there's the brand work, which I'm disconnecting from it because it's more on the marketing side. But mm -hmm. when you see there's a motion working, and you learn how the funnel works and how all of the conversion rates are like throughout from top of funnel all the way to bottom of, you know, actual closed one deals. Mm -hmm. Um, if you if you're confident about all those aspects of the company, then you can bring someone that knows how to scale. Yeah, the reason I ask this question is both in my lifetime, in places I worked, and hearing from other founders, etc. It's it's always a challenge. The average tenure of a CRO is now 18 months. Probably it has gone down now with all this shitstorm hitting the you know tech world. Um, and sometimes I feel like founders they see the CRO as a savior. Either that. Or they just want to outsource the stuff they don't want to do, you know, like the difficult conversations, the hiring and the firing and the scaling. Um, that's why it's always interesting. Like at what point somebody decides, okay, this is the time to hand over. This is the time to, you know, give my baby and to the safe hands of somebody. So do you want to add to any of yeah. that? Or There's leaders in the company that I delegated, you know, if we're, we're not talking about a VP R&D, we're not talking about a... A VP of product, you know, there's a lot of things as a CEO, you have to, like you said, maybe it's more about funding, 
but you have to be able to bring to the table people that will do some tasks and operations much, much better. So um, that was always my point of view. Even when we were seed funded, uh, I just brought who, whoever I could afford yeah. uh, to complement for my yeah. skills. Where do most Series B companies struggle, do you think? Like, where does the challenge of Series B start? I think like we talked about the Series A, I think the challenge is the bar in which you need to get to for your next round and Series C's have practically been non-existent. So that's something to keep, you know, that companies are now keeping in mind, not to mention Series D's and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. stuff that are much more in late growth. These are all, you know, until until funding becomes a bit better, things that companies are, are aware of. I would say there's expectations for scaling, like bringing a lot of clients and having the product work just fine of finding the sweet spot, you know, the ICP, the exact use case, the exact budget, um, the flow for expansion, alignment in between all the different teams, um, you know, the company. So, so it's really, it's, it's really not about just driving in random clients and onboarding whatever you can for yeah. some, for some more uh, revenues. It's really about building something that can scale, that you can pour more money into that is. Uh, rather efficient, of course, in today's uh, reality. You know, most of the companies built, uh, even before we did, but like early 2020, stuff like that, you know, DNA was a bit different. Then there was the tech bubble. DNA was different again. Now it's a downturn. You have to re-evaluate re everything again. So, you know, a little bit of a roller coaster for everyone. Yeah, and everyone's learning. It's it's so cool how eloquently you put forward the questions. Like, so those are what you have top of head, etc. Where do you look for inspiration or answers or how do you go about solving these things in your mind? So, for example, I do the podcast and I learn a lot from people. What do you do? I help a lot of early founders in terms of you saw you said something about investing, but there's also like just advisory or yeah. plain, you know, coffee or trying to help out um, founders that reach out. And that kind of opens your mind, like when you're helping someone. And you're providing feedback that really opens your mind to kind of just zoom out for a second from your own business as well. I have people on our cap table that I'm very proud to be working with. And, you know, they've been helping since day one. They built like mm -hmm. massive, many billion dollar companies. And um, there's always someone to consult with about all kinds of things. Other people's podcasts, you know, audiobooks, people, yeah. just people that I appreciate, you know, the path they had. Now coming towards the final section, this is where I put you on the therapist chairs. And so you will be the therapist now <laughs> and find the solutions for people. So what's the current problem you see in the market today? And obviously, like with Walnut's mission, we can delve into that a little bit more. But in your own observation, you know, look, talking to people, looking at social media, LinkedIn, whatever, like what do you feel like is a problem that uh, revenue teams in general are struggling with? I think that if every CFO in the world went over to his employees in the past two years and said we're gonna remove about 90 percent of our spend on software um, most tools did not survive that right Ooh. so people would keep their crm and they would keep their much much larger tools in the stack but every product built in the last under five years is you know didn't necessarily survive that so people are seeing and it's not just sales tools it's everywhere across SaaS and you know, security and, and, and marketing to it's everywhere. So, so this is one thing. And from the other hand, it's also a very slow time to be, to be building out outbound motions, right? People are less responsive to outbound messages. And then I saw there was also some new rules by Google for what is, what is a spam outreach email. So there's also a lot of things closing in on how you actually generate your, your pipeline. So it's a little bit like, for some industries, it's like a little perfect storm right now that yeah. revenue teams need to find yeah. a way and maneuver. My co-founder, Adam, when he heard that I'm going to be speaking to you, he told me you have to ask him about his article on New York Times, B2B sales is dead. What did you mean by that? There was a lot of interesting feedback for that article. Yeah. Hate emails, maybe? Was, some uh, hate emails as well? A lot of colorful uh, <laughs> okay. Good. comments. Um, I would say, yeah, I think I published it almost a year ago where the SaaS downturn was kind of, you know, coming to fruition. People realized things have changed and they had to adjust to it. And I heard from a lot of other companies that their sales are, you know, the KPIs and, and targets they had are just not realistic anymore. 
given everything that's going on. You know, I talked about more one-on-one personalized experiences for the prospects. I talked about, Mm -hmm. you know, just the cold mass emails don't work anymore. I talked about aiming for executives and C-levels and realizing that everybody now sells to a CEO or a CRO um, because... You know they're actually in 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 they're actually in demo calls right now. Even if it's a really large company, yeah, um, they want to know what they're gonna spend. Even if it's only like twenty k or whatever, they want to know who they're gonna spend it with. So there there's a lot of there's a lot of change that happened in the last two years. Very dramatic. Mm. Two two of the statements that were particularly interesting for me. So I'll go into those ones. One was sellers need to walk fast from slow moving prospects. Any practical things you would like to offer to expand on that? Um, given everything we just said, it's obvious, you know, if you're spending like six, seven months, eight months, you know, companies dragging you and they keep pushing you from one champion to another. And okay. it's not like a healthy multi-threading operation or it's not a Fortune 500 company. It's like a... You know, it's a medium-sized company and they keep telling you that, you know, they're super, super um, excited about your product. But now IT has to see you again, but they're super excited about your product. But, um, you know, they would need a 50% discount. And anyway, it can drag on for years if if you don't just put a stop to it. And you should have like a mechanism, you know, in place where X amount of days or X amount of days plus how big or small the company is, how serious they seem and all that. Because you have very you have very specific time frame where you have to talk to a specific amount of prospects and some will move fast. You have to focus on them, especially in such a slow market. There's just no, there's no other choice. It's not like what it was uh, before two years ago where everyone were buying everything and everyone had credit cards to spend and you know everything was super super amazing when starting to build flola what i had in mind was a bit more like an apollo you know plg because i was the sales leader and i was telling my team dude whatever you need here's your budget go and get it you know if you need a lead gen tool if you need a whatever uh, you know call recording tool this is your budget you be the owner of your territory go and buy it or let's discuss quickly to realize and things shifted very quickly that that's not the way, unfortunately, buying still happens today. The other one that I want a bit of commentary on, if you don't mind, is leaky buckets are now tsunamis. Is it still, you know, compared to one year ago, maybe it's worse? Can you expand on that a little? Yeah. When you just build out your company initially, if things are going well, then people tend to ignore uh, problems, right? They tend to ignore, if it's a PLG, we don't have the right you know, analytics or software installed. If it's enterprise sales, we don't have a proper mechanism to keep track of what is being sent during the process or how long it took, or, you know, our AEs are just filling out Salesforce, you know, uh, from their own POV saying it was an amazing call, but it doesn't mean (laughs) anything. And we don't have any like, you know, um, documentation for anything. There's like a million things that can qualify as a, as a leaky bucket in, in, in early SaaS companies. And when everyone's buying everything, right, it's it's fine to put them aside because you're going to meet your targets. But if it's a new reality, then then you have to fix all those holes because they're definitely going to just keep you farther away from your, your targets. Yeah, absolutely. And when you say those anecdotal conversations, you have your weekly pipeline review and both sides know they're a little bit telling a story to each other. That's something that I hated to do as an IC, like... You know, having to paint that picture every every week. Oh, yeah, they're having a conversation. No, no, no. And then as a manager listening to the story, which is why in Flola we're building a lot of insights, etc., trying to shed a light into that dark corners. Do you use something specific to be in the know? Like, I don't know, revenue intelligence tools or or your own tool? Or what, what, what do you go to for getting a bit more visibility into what's happening in your pipelines? So we're communicating every day and we have our tools and we use, like, of course, Gong for, for intelligence and we're very hardcore in, in how we use our CRM. And um, we also have insights within Walnut that lets you know yeah, of course. Um, how the salespeople are using demos and how the, the deal is progressing. So we, of course, also use our own product for that. And one more question that I ask every leader, 
coming to this journey, what's the one tool, resource, department or whatever you feel like you couldn't do it without? I would say it's alignment between the different teams, mm-hmm. which is, it doesn't sound like a monetary resource, but it is, it's everything. If you're building out your MVP, if both founders are not seeing it the same way, you know, if your first VP of sales or VP of product don't see it the same way, if CS are driving the, this and people are driving there, um, that's just going to cost you a lot of time and efforts to to fix. The last question from me, and then I'm going to ask your closing remarks, is this is actually coming from our head of content, um, Ellen. She asked me to talk about We Are Prospects. And she said in her own words, I quote, this is the first time I saw a B2B company in B2B bring the importance of buyer experience to the forefront. Mm, that's a strong statement. So how did how did you guys shape that? Like, where did that come from? And where is it today? How can people get involved? We didn't expect it to unfold the way it did. Like, you know, we didn't spend a lot of budget on, on anything uh, regarding the movement, but... It completely exploded and was super viral on, on LinkedIn. I think what worked for us was we just touched the right emotions mm. in the right timing and on the right platform. Uh, we did it in a way that was funny because we identified our brand, you know, tone of voice as, as, a, as being funny. And But yeah, I think, I think we spent like 10K on the entire production <laughs> and we wrote the script and, you know, I was the guy that's pouring the coffee on her at first. And our <laughs> VP of marketing was working also in this in the shirt store and our PMM was walking on the street. So everybody on the team were involved and we just published it on LinkedIn. And, you know, so I came up with the We Are Prospects hashtag, but we didn't really expect it to go beyond a couple of shares and, enge- and engagement. But we we woke up the next day and. And LinkedIn was just on fire. Like it was viewed by millions of people. It was shared by hundreds of, of executives. And um, and then we just took it from there to places where it just became more and more crazy. And every time it was perceived um, better and better than the last time. I love that. Yes, you didn't expect it, but I'm sure everybody was delighted. So we all, you know, pray for those viral gods to, to give us that kind of exposure <laughs> because a lot of work goes into it, no matter what the result. All right. Yeah. This was a great chat for me, you have. Uh, you're an inspiration and your team, I'm sure to a lot of people. Any closing remarks before we finish? Um, no, I think we talked, you know, we talked about some interesting things about, you know, it's it's all about the people that surround you, about uh, starting from customers actually wanting to pay for what you're about to build and not yeah. the other way around. Um, strong leadership, and just wait through this downturn. You know, it's not something we can uh, we can control. So just do whatever you can to to stay alive. So um, like yeah. any any good therapist, I'm going to have to cut us on the clock. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. That's going to be a wrap on this episode of Sales Therapy. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe to us on YouTube and your favorite podcast platform. Uh, thank you so much, Rav, for being with us. And I hope to catch up soon again. Thanks for having me. Thank <music> you.